morning, Larry Lu from MIT. Uh, he will talk about, uh, he will present the proof of the coupling for the parabola, and we will see the epsilon gain, and then close the step of the induction. Please, Larry. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. It's really great to see so many people here for the third talk of, of three talks. It feels exciting for me. Um, uh, okay, well, let me quickly remind people what we've been talking about. Um, so we're talking about the decoupling problem. So we take a slender neighborhood of a parabola, and we cover it with rectangles that are called theta. And it's a lot of rectangles, and a is the number of rectangles. And so each of them has these dimensions. Um, and then we take a function whose Fourier support is contained in this slender neighborhood of a parabola. The function is called f. And we break it up as a sum of pieces f theta, where f theta is the portion of the Fourier integral coming from theta. And we want to understand how the LP norm of the function f relates to the LP norm of the pieces. And so, um, so the decoupling constant, d sub p of a, is the best constant that makes this true. Um, and the theorem of Bourgain and Demeter is that for this range of p, which is the optimal range of p, the decoupling constant is almost 1. It grows smaller than an a to the epsilon. Cool. OK. And so the goal today is to br bring together all the ideas we've been talking about and sketch the proof of this theorem. Um, our goal is to sketch the proof. And so, there are, so there are three things going into it. There's many scales which we talked about a lot last time. There is orthogonality, which is you know, central in almost all of Fourier analysis. And then there's going to be a little bit of geometry, which I'll explain more. So as we go through, we'll, we'll see these three things. And these are really the only three things, in a sense, elementary, the elementary ingredients combined in a really nice way that prove this there. OK. Um, so before we start the proof, there's one more thing that I'd like to do to get ready. There's, there's one more kind of simple variation or corollary of this, which is helpful to know about, which is called local decoupling. Local means that instead of looking at the LP norm on the entire plane, we could look on the LP norm on some box. Uh, OK, so here's how that goes. Proposition. Suppose that box is a box of side length a squared contained in the plane. Um, and then eta theta is a bump function that's designed to, uh, that's, that's a smooth cutoff function for the box. So eta theta is roughly 1 on the box, and then it rapidly decays outside. So there, there exists some cutoff function, so that the following is true. If I take the LP norm of the function f just on this box, not on the whole space, then that's bounded um, up to a factor of 10 or something by the same decoupling constant times the sum over theta. Um, OK. And what I would sort of like to write here is the LP norm of the pieces on the box. That would be like just like this old decoupling theorem, but on this box. Um, that's not quite true, but, but what is true is I can put here eta box f theta. So you think about eta box f theta, it looks like f theta on the box, and outside of that, it decays quite rapidly, uh, but not literally zero. And, and so that's where it can go here. OK. Um, so the proof of this is quite simple. We just choose eta theta so that its Fourier support is small. Um, so we can arrange that the support of eta theta hat is contained in a ball of radius 1 over a squared. 1 over a squared is the number that appears up there as the thickness of these rectangles. So now if I take the Fourier support of eta theta, sorry, eta box f theta all hat, uh, I get that by convolving f theta hat with the Fourier, with eta box hat. And so it's contained in a 1 over a squared neighborhood of theta. And that's basically the same thing as theta. So this function 
morally uh, has its Fourier support on theta. And then I apply the original decoupling to, to this function. So when I apply the decoupling to eta times f, on the left-hand side, I'll have eta times f LP, which is, which is bigger than this. And that will be controlled by, on the right-hand side, eta times f theta LPs. OK. OK. So that's useful in some applications. And, um, and then if I, if I have a function f on all of space, uh, I, could, I could just use this inequality. But there's another thing that I could do, which is I could cut the space into boxes, and I could use local decoupling on each of those boxes. And I want to take a moment to compare those two options. So here's option number one, regular de decoupling by the definition. And option number two is I could take f, I'm interested in flp. I can break the space up into boxes, like the boxes in this proposition. Um, I could take the sum over boxes, flp of the box to the p to the 1 over p. Okay. And now I can perform decoupling on each of those boxes. So for this flp of the box, I can plug in this bound here. Um, and I'm going to um, be a little bit non rigorous and pretend that this is just the lp norm of f theta on the box. So when I plug that in, I get decoupling constant of A times this like kind of long expression, but which is going to be an important character in our proof. So here's what, here's what we get. Have the sum over the boxes, and then in each box, the sum over theta, F theta LP of the box squared to the P over 2. So th this thing is what I get by plugging in the bound for FLP of the box. And then I just finish writing what was there. OK. Um, cool. So I, t I told you this to introduce this character. Um, this is an important character in the proof of decoupling. And I wanted to explain where it comes from. And uh, something I find challenging about presenting the proof of decoupling is that, is that at, at least if you do the, yeah, is that the, the proof involves some pretty long equations, and this is a typical sort of thing, typical sort of equation that we're going to be, that we manipulate in the proof of decoupling. And when the equations get this long, at least for me, it's very difficult to maintain my intuition of what's going on. So uh, anyway, so I've been working on trying to keep the equations as short as possible, but this is turned, as far as I can tell, this thing is crucial. So, I, so, I, so we introduce it. Um, so let's take a moment to get to know it. To get to know it, here's a question we can ask ourselves. We have two different upper bounds for FLP, uh, there and here. Uh, so we ask ourselves, which one of those upper bounds is better? Is this better than that? Is that better than this? Does it depend on the function F? Depends on the function. What's that? Depends on the function. Depends on the function. Yeah. OK, so it turns out that this is always at least as good as that, and it's often better. Let me give you an example where it's better. Um, let's call this, call this 2. I have an example. Suppose that all the f thetas have LP norm 1, and the support of the f theta are contained in different, so each, each f theta is supported in a different box. So then what will happen? Um, for inequality 1, I'm just taking a sum of squares of these numbers 1. So I get on the right hand side an a to the 1 half. But for inequality 2, what will happen? Um, for each box, there is only one theta that lives in that box, so this sum is irrelevant. Um, and, but when we compare the different thetas, we get to benefit from this 1 over p. So in, in situation 2, we get a to the 1 over p. Okay. 
Um, another example you could think about is if all of the thetas are only supported in, the, in one box and it's the same box, then this sum is irrelevant and this thing is just the same as that thing. Okay. Um, and it's an exercise. Not a, I don't think of it as a real easy exercise, but an exercise that 2 is always smaller than 1. And it uses the Minkowski inequality. So, so now we're going to begin the proof. And let's recall the setup that we have last time of looking at many different scales. Uh, OK, so we have our parabola. And we cut it into tiny, tiny pieces, our original theta, also called theta upper 0, the zeroth scale are tiny, tiny. And we group them into some bigger blocks. And these bigger blocks are called theta 1. And the bigger blocks, in turn, we group into even bigger blocks called theta 2, and so on, until we get to the whole parabola. Um, OK. Let's say that the number of the theta j's is a sub j. Um, and the, the choice is going to be, the a, so a sub 0 is, is, of course, a. a sub 1 is a to the 1 half. a sub 2 is a to the 1 quarter, et cetera. And those are our multiple scales. Cool. Um, so then we can take a portion of f for each of these for each of these um, arcs, f theta j. And f theta j will be a sum of wave packets of dimensions aj by aj squared. And if we want to study f theta j, it's, if we would like to cut the plane into, into boxes analogous to this, the, the right scale of boxes, the analogous scale of boxes, is that we'll say box j has side length aj squared. Cool. OK, so we're going to look at it at all these different scales. And we want to understand how things change as we increase j, as we group more and more of these blocks together. Um, so the key character, the key, um, the way of keeping score of whether we're making an improvement as j increases, is this expression here, and, but the analog of that for j. Um, so we're going to study this thing. E sub j of f, which is defined to be, this is a new definition. This is not, not the same E sub j of f we used last time. It's um, this animal at scale j. It's the sum over the box j's. And then for each box, we sum over the theta j's. f theta j lp of the box squared the p over 2 to the 1 over p. Whew. That was a mouthful or a chockful. Uh, how are we doing? Are there questions? OK. So we introduced a kind of complicated expression, which is a little bit motivated. And I'm going to, it's not clear yet, but I'm going to try to show you that this thing behaves in a pretty nice way as we increase j. So let me now make an outline of the proof. Um, Uh, 
Um, so let's say that these scales, there's uh, you know, a0, a1, and so on. And the last scale is going to be called a sub s. So a sub s is just 1. s is the name of the last scale. So at the last scale, um, this thing is, is really simple. There is no sum here, because there's just one theta j at the last scale. And it's easy to check that e sub s of f is just the LP norm of f. It's a character that we're interested in. So flp is just the final e sub s of f. And we'd like to prove that that's not too much bigger than the initial e of f, e sub 0 of f, um, which in turn is smaller than a epsilon sum on theta of f theta lp squared to the 1 half. And this is, this is the thing that we just observed, that this more refined animal, still there, this more refined animal is smaller than number 1. That's this inequality here. OK. So we're going to keep track of how e sub j changes as we increase j. Um, and so the outline of our proof is that step 1, we're going to find a good j so that e j plus 1 of f is bounded by um, the appropriate thing to the epsilon times ej of f, so only a little bigger than ej of f. And the appropriate thing is aj over aj plus 1, because that's the number of j intervals in a j plus 1 interval. So we're going to find one good j where this is true. And then the second part of the argument is that we use induction on scales. the induction on scales trick to deal with the, the other parts, the scales between s and j plus 1, and the scale between j and 0 by, by induction on scales. And we talked a lot about that in lecture 2. So that one of the, the goal of lecture 2 really was to explain this idea, though we ex explained it in a slightly simpler situation. Um, so today I'm going to focus on number 1. So let's also recall our um, visual image of what these f theta j's look like. And today, so we, we, we drew some pictures last time of what the f theta j's look like. And we're going to review those pictures now. And we're going to build on it a little bit by keeping track quantitatively. And, um, and so complementing the pictures by writing down equations that describe what's going on. Um, OK. So I'd like to make for you a portrait of the f theta j's. Um, and so on the top board is going to be the picture. And on the bottom board is going to be some text describing what are the key features in the picture. So in the picture, there are going to be some important boxes, some important box j, um, whose side length is aj squared. And xj is the name of the union of these boxes. So in the picture, let's make two of them. So what do I mean by important boxes? Well, in different parts of in, in, in these different boxes make a different amount of contribution to FLP. And the important boxes are the boxes that, you know, if, you, if we just include the important boxes, that should be about the same to capture most of the LP norm of F. Uh, OK. Then in each, in each box, there are going to be some wave packets. So for every one of these important boxes, um, there are going to be some number of important f theta j's. So at least one f theta j needs to be pretty big in this box for it to matter. 
They don't all have to be pretty big, but some number of them are. That number is d sub j. And for each of those, um, for each of those, there's a number wj, which is the really important number, uh, wave packets. And they have a height hj. OK, so let's draw the picture corresponding to this. So in each one of these boxes, there will be some number of directions of wave packets. Um, so maybe there are two wave packets in this direction and two wave packets in this direction. And over in this box, the boxes are, are, are the same as each other from the way I've described this. So there should also be two directions, but maybe not the same two directions. So in here, there are also two directions. And for each direction, there are also two wave packets. Okay. So in the, in the picture, um, d sub j is 2, and w sub j is also 2. Now what, is, what is height? Height is, yeah, maybe that's a bad word. I've, so height means the absolute value of this. And I visualize. And we're looking down on these functions, so they're sticking out of the board, and the height is how far they stick. Thanks. Other questions? I'm sorry, there, there must be a, some sort of pigeonholing argument to assume that dj is constant on, on every one of these boxes. Yeah, that's right. That's a great point. Yeah, so there's a question is, why am I allowed to assume that things are so uniform? Um, so for example, why can I assume that d sub j is the same on all of the different boxes? Well, yeah, so there are a bunch of boxes. And d sub j actually may not be the same on all of the boxes. But I can do what's called dyadic pigeonholing. So the smallest d sub j could be is 1. And the biggest it could be is the number of different theta j's, a sub j. And so I, I group the boxes into boxes where d sub j is about 2, boxes where d sub j is about 4, boxes where it's about 8, and so on. And the number of different categories that I have is only log of aj, which is small compared to the, to the things I'm losing all over the place. And then I just pick one of those categories that makes a pretty good contribution to f, and I just look at those boxes. And in that way, I can assume that d sub j is basically the same in all of the different boxes I look at. And by the same argument, I can assume that these other things are uniform. <coughs> Other questions? So are all the boxes supposed to be the same size? All the boxes are the same size, that's right. And, this, and that size is aj squared, the length of a wave packet at scale j. Okay. And the, yeah, that's right. The wave packets are also all the same size okay. as each other. Great. OK. Um, OK, so with a little help from this picture, we're going to try to understand this thing ej of f and how it changes when we go from j to j plus 1. Yeah, and I must say, so ej of f, it, it looks pretty complicated. Um, and, and actually, but actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain that this, is, that this is a good thing to look at because it, it transforms pretty nicely when we go from j to j plus 1. And it, the way to, so a way to think about it that helps to make it seem nicer is that it's, it's, going, that it's not that different from an L2 norm of f. And L2 norms of f are really helpful. We understand them well, and we can use orthogonality. So what I'd like to do is to compare this frightening looking thing with, with an L2 norm. Like to make a comparison of e sub j of f versus the L2 norm of f on xj. So xj is the union of these boxes that are important at scale j. I'd like to compare these. And I'm going to do it by writing both of them in terms of this stuff. So let's write e sub j of f in terms of this data about the picture. 
Um, so there's the definition. We're supposed to sum over the boxes, but we only need to sum over the important boxes. The rest of them make a negligible contribution. And they're all the same as each other because of all this uniformity. So what I pick up from this sum over the boxes is just the number of boxes to the 1 over p. So the first thing I get is the number of boxes in xj to the 1 over p. OK. Then I look in each box, and I need to evaluate this thing. Um, well, I'm going to sum over some different thetas, different directions. And I only need to sum over the, the important ones. The other ones make a negligible contribution. And there are dj important ones. And the, the thing I'm summing is, by uniformity, those are all the same. So I pick up a power of dj. And, it, and because it's a, this is a quadratic square root cancellation thing, what I pick up there is dj to the 1 half. OK. And then I'm just looking at the LP norm of, of a f theta j on the box. And so that function, it has a norm or height norm hj. And it's supported on these wj wave packets. So for example, I'm looking at one of, one of the f theta j's is supported on those two rectangles. And it has some height hj. And I want to compute its LP norm. So I, I get um, hj times the 1 over p norm of the 1 over p power of the volume of the support. So if the support were the whole box, I could put a box there. But it's only a fraction of the box. What fraction is it? It's the wj over aj fraction of the box. OK. Let's try to simplify this a little bit as best we can. Um, we can put the two 1 over p powers together. And when we do that, we get the number of boxes times the volume of a box. So that's nice. So we get the volume of xj wj over aj to the 1 over p times dj to the 1 half times hj. OK. OK. Um, now for comparison, I claim that fl2 of xj is the same expression except that 1 over p becomes just 1 half. Like if p was 2, this would just be the L2 norm of f on xj. And the proof of that is similar. If I imagine that p is 2, then this thing here is the L2 norm of one of my functions f theta j on a box. And then this thing, by orthogonality, is the L2 norm of their sum on the box, the L2 norm of f on the box. And then um, this thing, multiplying by the number of boxes to the 1 half, would give me the L2 norm of f on all of xj. OK, maybe we should pause there. Uh, yeah, was this OK? Um, right. Okay. So the question. So the question is, which is a little bit technical. We we did this um, pruning procedure to make everything uniform, and when we do that, we're, the the things that we kept were the ones that contributed to the LP norm. That's what I wanted to keep because I I want to understand FLP. But um, it could be that the things that that some other bucket wasn't so important for the LP norm, but it made a big contribution for the L2 norm. And so here, when I say I'm measuring the L2 norm, I might have left out uh, something that was important for the L2 norm. Yeah. OK. Let me just say, if you do it carefully, the, the issue that, that we've left out things gives us an inequality in the right direction. It just makes it, just makes it better for us. OK, so the point of this is that we, we really care about the ratio ej plus 1 of f over ej of f. We want to say that that ratio is not too big. 
And this, this, um, this thing, e sub j of f, is a lot like fl2 of xj, except we have to make a little adjustment there. And that means that we can write the ratio as we, that we really care about as a ratio of L2 norms times some corrections, but that are pretty simple. So let's write that down. ratio I really care about, ej plus 1 of f over ej of f, is f l2 xj plus 1 over f l2 of xj times a correction, which comes from the fact that I, um, right now with those l2 norms, I have this thing to the 1 half, and I need to have this thing to the 1 over p. So the corrections are, um, xj over xj plus 1 to the 1 half minus 1 over p times uh, a correction times this issue. So that works out to be wj over wj plus 1 aj to the 1 half, to the 1 half minus 1 over p. So there's a certain amount of algebra there that was a touch unpleasant, but it's, it would be easy for you to check at home. OK. So this might still look like a pretty long formula, but I, I claim that this is quite a nice formula. Um, because these are L2 norms that we're going to be able to study with orthogonality. This is some, something about the geometry of sets. We'll be able to draw a picture of it. Um, and then there are these wj's that we talked about last time. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So recall from last time that we talked about an, uh, a pretty good scale. This is, so we, we, we use the fact that we can choose j to try to make these wj's behave not too badly. And, um, well, we can see wj is in the numerator and wj plus 1 is in the denominator. We want this thing to be small. So it's bad for us if wj is big and wj plus 1 is small. And a pretty good scale was when wj plus 1 was not too small compared to wj. So let, let me write that down. Recall from last time that j is called epsilon good if wj plus 1 is bigger than wj to the 1 minus epsilon over 2. It's equivalent to the way we wrote it last time. OK, so to, 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 to reiterate our strategy a little bit, by looking at many scales, we're able to get some favorable information about the w's. And that's going to be to control this term. By looking at orthogonality, we're going to have a pretty good understanding of this term. Um, and, uh, and, and that will lead us to some geometry we'll, we'll see in a little bit. So that's the plan for how we're going to control this. Um, OK, so let me show you that this is a good thing um, by thinking about a special case of uh, where this right-hand side becomes particularly simple. The special case is when xj plus 1 is the same as xj. That simplifies the right-hand side a lot, because then these L2 norms are clearly the same, and these volumes are clearly the same. So we just have this w term. special case, xj plus 1 is the same as xj, then our ratio is 
is just um, wj over wj plus 1 aj to the 1 half raised to some power, which is not some positive power, which is not important. Um, and this, so if we don't choose scales carefully, this could be bad. The worst thing that could happen is that wj could be aj, which is its maximal value, and wj plus 1 could be 1. And if that happens, this fraction is pretty big. It's a sub j to the 1 half, a big number. And then our ratio is much bigger than 1. This is the, the same example that, we looked, that I drew on the board at the end of lecture 2. So at that time, I tried to describe it by drawing pictures, and then this comp maybe complementary description in terms, of, uh, in terms of equations. So this would be bad for us. Um, but this is not an epsilon good scale. An epsilon good scale would be better. So if j is an epsilon good scale, then, um, then in this ratio, wj plus 1 needs to be at least as big as about wj to the 1 half. So I get some cancellation here. I'm left with wj to the 1 plus epsilon over 2 over aj. And wj is at most aj. Um, so this is really not much bigger than this. This is less than aj to the epsilon over 2. So in this special case that xj plus 1 is xj, just assuming this epsilon good condition uh, is enough to show that the ratio behaves well. Thanks. Any questions about this special case? So in, the, so in this situation, we put the WJ to be AJ, or what? Um, so it, it, we, did, we did an example where WJ is AJ. But here, I just assume that J is epsilon good. Being epsilon good tells me that this is pretty, good, pretty big compared to that. So I got that inequality. And uh, the last part is because WJ is less or equal than uh, AJ, or? Yeah, that's right. And the last part is because wj is less than or equal to aj. Um, I was meaning to write that actually on this board. Let's just remember what it means in terms of the picture. So if wj is 1, it means there's just one wave packet in this box. And if wj is aj, it means the wave packets completely fill the box. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It will come in at some point. That's right. It will come in at some point uh, soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so we did the special case that xj plus 1 is xj. That's just a special case. xj plus 1 could be smaller. Um, I thought it would be helpful to try to draw in red. So maybe x, so xj plus 1 is a collection of cubes at the next smaller scale. And the width of those cubes, or the side length of those cubes, is the width of a wave packet at the j scale. So I'll draw here. Uh, so xj plus 1 is in red. OK. So. So in this situation, there's an important geometric parameter, which is um, how much of a wave packet lies in the red set. So let's give that a name. So if t is a wave packet, lambda of t is defined to be the volume of t in the red set in xj plus 1 divided by the volume of t. In other words, the density of the red set in the wave packet. So t might be uh, this, this uh, rectangle here. OK. 
um, and by dyadic pigeonholing again. So there are wave packets with various values of lambda of t, but by dyadic pigeonholing again, I can focus on one particular value. So I can assume that lambda of t is basically lambda for all of the different t. OK. So this geometric quantity um, is, dictates the behavior of this term. So more precisely, we have the following lemma. lemma FL2 of xj plus 1 squared is exactly lambda times FL2 of xj squared. Yeah. So, so the point of the proof is that it's quite easy to understand how these things are behaving because of orthogonality. So proof. The left-hand side is the sum over the boxes in xj plus 1 um, of fl2 squared. But by orthogonality, I can put the sum over the theta j's of f theta j l2 squared. Because on each of these boxes, these functions are orthogonal to each other. OK. And now I can switch the order of these sums. So for each theta j, I'm adding up the L2 norm squared on some boxes. So I get the L2 norm squared on the union. So I get the sum on theta j of f L2 squared of, uh, I think I skipped a step here. So I want, so I want to introduce lambda. So I can expand this into, into wave packets. So this is the sum over boxes, the sum over wave packets t. Um, let me, to, not make a, to not make a mess, let me check how I, how I wrote this in my notes. It was, it was okay. What I was doing the first time was not bad. Okay, so I'm just going to switch the order of these sums. And then for each theta j, I'm now taking the L2 norm of this function over the union of all these boxes. So I get the sum over theta j of, of f theta j L2 of xj plus 1. OK. And then if I think about f theta j, f theta j is constant on wave packets. So f theta j might look like these two tubes here. And each tube spends a lambda fraction of its time in xj plus 1. So, so this is a sum over the same of lambda times f theta j L2 of xj squared. That was the key step, so let's pause there. Um, OK, and, and that's it. Then these functions are orthogonal on fj. So this is lambda times f l2 of xj. So we figured out what. Yeah. So the so the question was, I at this step here, I claimed that these functions were orthogonal, 
not, on, not just on the whole space, which they certainly are, but on this domain. Um, so we talked a little bit about that last time. That's not literally true. It's heuristic, I think you were saying. Uh, it's approximately true. So the whole proof has some extra fine print at that moment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right here? Yeah. yeah, so for this to be true, what we would have to know is that the, the function f theta j was literally constant on this tube t and that tube t and literally zero outside of them. And again, there's a little bit of fine print there, but it's not so far from being true. Okay, so modulo some fine print we have come up with a much simpler interpretation of this quotient. It's this number lambda that measures what fraction of a tube is in the red boxes. Um, this thing has a, has a similar interpretation. xj plus 1 is the union of the red boxes, and xj is the union of the bigger boxes. So it's also a sort of density. Um, let's give it a name as well. So let's say rho is... Um, the size of a box intersect xj plus 1 divided by the size of the box. It's the density of the red set in the boxes. And in this language, we can now rewrite this um, messy equation in a way that looks a little simpler. So let, let's do that. Okay, so the quotient that we are trying to bound is basically lambda to the 1 half. The 1 half comes because those are the L2 norms, not squared, times rho to the, um, uh, so rho is xj plus 1 over xj, so it's 1 over p minus a half times this w term, which I'm just going to rewrite as w term. It's the one up there. And we'd like to know how big that is. Um, and so it's not obvious how big this is, but I'd like to notice that at this point, all of the um, Fourier analysis has disappeared from the picture. So these are some numbers, and all that we're going to use about them is that they're epsilon good. And then these are just some geometric things about boxes and rectangles in a bigger box. So understanding how this could behave is just a geometry problem. And a geometry problem I could summarize, I could summarize the geometry problem as um, how, are, how are lambda and rho related. Um, so there's a, there's a trivial inequality involving our characters. Uh, I'll call it trivial. Uh, it says that wj over aj times lambda is smaller than rho. And I can prove it by a picture. So here's the big box. Inside of it are some wave packets. And Inside of each of the wave packets, there are some red boxes which have a density lambda inside the packet. There may also be some red boxes that are not in these wave packets. I don't know. But um, just the red boxes in the wave packets have this density, because this is the density of the wave packets, wj over aj times the density of the red things in each one. So the total density has to be bigger than that. And it could be much bigger if there's a lot of boxes outside. Uh, OK. 
So that's all right. It, it is useful. But if you just plug it in, uh, it will turn out that that is not enough to show that this thing is, is small. OK. So let's try to get some more intuition by looking at a few examples and seeing how rho and lambda may behave. So example one. In example one, the red stuff is all in the middle in a smaller box. And then there are some wave packets that go through here. OK. I'll just draw two, but you can imagine lots of other wave packets, and it would be similar. And in this scenario, lambda is rho to the 1 half. OK. Another thing that could happen is I could take these little red boxes, and instead of clumping them all, I could spread them out a little more. So I have a picture like that. And uh, some wave packet may manage to go through. This, is, this wave packet. For this set of red boxes, this wave packet does the best job of going through a lot of them. Some other wave packet may not do as well. Okay. And in, in this example, too, as long as these things are spread out pretty evenly in this way, <coughs> lambda is at most <coughs> rho to the 1 half. So this, this clever, this best one has lambda rho to the 1 half. And this not so good one has a smaller lambda. OK. Um, so based on those examples, you might wonder, is it always true that lambda is smaller than rho to the 1 half? And the answer is no. So I'll draw a third example. And in the third example, um, all of the red things are located in a, in a narrow rectangle, something like that. And then I can have wave packets that are parallel to this, or almost parallel to this. So in this, in this picture, lambda is actually 1, which is way bigger than rho to the 1 half. Rho to the 1 half is pretty small. Cool. OK. Um, so these pictures, I think, are, are pretty representative of all of the ways that these boxes and tubes could look to the best of my knowledge and intuition. Uh, so if I want to sort of see if something is working, I, I test it in these three examples, and, and I see if it, if it works. And these examples are kind of different from each other. This one I'll call um, broad. Define what, so we'll, so, we'll, so we'll give a definition of these words in, in a minute. But they have some kind of different character. And the character of the first two I'll call broad. And the character of the last one I'll call narrow. OK. Um, so it turns out that in the, so in the broad case, which we'll define in a second, this is always true. Lambda is always smaller than rho to the 1 half. And then you can do a computation. You take this inequality and that inequality and the stuff we know about w, and you just compute what this right-hand side is. And it's small. It's smaller than aj to the epsilon. Um, and that somebody asked where the 1 over p is. That computation will depend on this p being between 2 and 6. That's where it will break down. Um, OK. And this example is good for a different reason. So let me now explain to you what narrow means and why narrow is good. And then I think we'll be, be, be basically time to stop. Yeah. OK. So narrow means that for a typical box, for a typical box at the, at the smaller box scale, um, 
the tubes, the wave packets through this box are almost all in a narrow range of angles. So let's test this definition, approximate definition on the picture. In this picture, if I take one of these smaller boxes, there are maybe several different wave packets going through it, but they all point almost that way. So that matches the definition of narrow. Whereas if you looked in this picture, if we take this box here, it has wave packets in several directions, and it could easily have wave packets in the whole range of directions that all have this lambda density. So this is not narrow. OK, so what's good about being narrow? Um, all right. So, so in the narrow case, I just drew one of these. There could be another one over here at a slightly different angle, and it could incorporate some other f, other parts of the parabola. But so, but um, so, but what's good about it is the following: we we choose some k maybe much bigger than a. We choose k close to s, and we break up f uh, as the sum of f theta k at this much coarser scale. And the point is that the box that, that, for, that um, on, on box j plus 1, only 1 f theta k is big. Because the f theta k's uh, correspond to wave packets in certain angular regions. And we're assuming, the narrow case, that all of the wave packets through this tube are in one rather small angular region. That corresponds to 1 f theta k. So in other words, the supports of the f theta k are morally disjoint. Um, and that situation is not threatening at all. In that case, FLP, if we go from FLP to just breaking it down to these f theta k's, we get the sum f theta k lp to the p to the 1 over p. That's what happens when we take a decomposition with functions with disjoint supports. And this is much better than square root cancellation. So this is less than. OK. So in this, in this narrow case, actually, in a different in a, in a, there's a different scale going from k to s. That's the scale range where something nice happens. But in every case, there's some scale range where something nice happens. Cool. OK. Um, so broad is defined to be not narrow. And the part of the proof that we didn't have time to do together in lecture is to check this fact about boxes and rectangles that if you have a broad uh, set of boxes and rectangles, then lambda is smaller than rho to the 1 half. And that allows to control the broad case. Cool. OK, I worry I'm going on too long. So I think that this is a good time to stop. Thank you for having me. Yeah. No, I was, I was wondering, uh, I mean, in, the, in your sketch, you, you presented several cases of somehow morally orthogonal and, and so on. In, in practice, you would have to estimate a lot of states, I suppose. But is there, a, for, for this decoupling problem, any meaningful Wolf model or something like this where the moral orthogonality could turn into actual orthogonality? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. So the Walsh model is a, is a different setting, analogous to some of the classical questions for Fourier analysis, but where some of these annoying tails become easier to deal with. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's a nice question if there could be a decoupling 
theory there. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so one important place was just here at the end. In the narrow situation, we knew geometrically that all of the wave packets were pointing in almost the same direction. And that allowed us to say that they came from one piece of the parabola, because the other pieces of the parabola were, had wave packets that were pointing in other directions. So if we didn't have that curvature of the parabola, all of these wave packets pointing in the same direction could have been coming from all over the parabola. And we couldn't do, or all over the curve, and we couldn't do this step. Yeah, good. Um, I think so. That's good, yeah, it's surprising that we didn't use it until so late, because it's kind of a fundamental thing. But um, yeah, it's the first time that we used it. For elaborating more on, on his question, I mean, it looks like almost any type of curvature that you have would give you, so it's, it's nothing special about parabolas at all these people. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So with almost the same proof, you could do any curve, a circle, uh, so even something not so smooth. Um, the moment where we kind of use it was a parabola is at some point we said if we take a small arc of the parabola and we rescale it, then we get the whole parabola. Um, so for another curve, we have to, to do something a bit more technical at that one moment. But it, it's not important. That's right. What about LP decoupling? So you have a, um, well, again, we don't really have a paper with LP decoupling. So what additional difficulty um, does it, um, is involved to replace those? Yeah, so the, okay, so the question is, do we have a decoupling on the board? So instead of the sum of some something norms squared to the 1 half, you might consider the sum of some something norms to the p to the 1 over p. Um, and what would be different? Yeah. I, don't have a, I don't have a helpful answer to say at the... Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're trying to get below. I mean, you're, you're presumably you want to get below two, and I mean, there's just not many examples where you can beat the one half. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in those, so in those papers, we we don't get better than they don't get better than square root cancellation, but um, they want to say that if you just there are situations where if you just have a few caps, actually something bad could happen, but if you have all of a lot of caps, then there's a better estimate. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it offline. It's not. Yeah. Is it, is it clear in this proof that P equals 6 is critical? Um, yeah. So the way I like to think of the proof is that it reduced the general problem to a few cases that you have to check. When you check these cases, then in, in, a, in a case sort of like, like this one, um, and you see that P equals 6 is critical. So, so the question is, instead of C epsilon, R to the epsilon, uh, if we wanted to make that a, a little better, um, what, what could we say? So the, the conjecture is that we could bring it down to log of R, or some, some even nice power of log of R. And what's known is like just such a little improvement on C epsilon, R to the epsilon. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure if it would have applications. Um, there are, so one of the applications of this is the periodic Schrodinger equation. And there are people who study, say, the nonlinear periodic Schrodinger equation. 
I'm not an expert. I think they might want to know actually these very fine details about this C epsilon R to the epsilon. But I'm not sure exactly what it would be good for. Okay. Let's not make it again. <laughs>